Hi, we continue today in Luke 8 and reach the central section of the passage from 8:40 to 56 that begins with the desperate need of a synagogue leader whose 12 year old daughter is dying and continues with the story of a woman who spent all she had on physicians but they were unable to heal her and for 12 years her bleeding has kept her paralyzed. And so we continue in the middle section here of these interlocking stories of two daughters healed by Jesus. As you can see on the right side of the screen, we're also looking at, as we've been doing all along, how Luke takes what he got from Mark, the blue on the left, and Luke in the center in the pink, and adapts it. So the bold on the left is what is in Mark that's not in Luke or Matthew, and the part in bold in the center is the part that Luke adds. And one of the major differences we see in our central section here, here's Mark's central section, and here's our central section, is in Mark, the woman speaks, at least that the audience hears, we're probably listening to her thoughts, for she said, if I but touch his clothes, that will be made well. Uh, but here, we don't have any reason to know why she's doing that. And then further, we hear her uh, about her experiential response. She felt in her body that she was healed of her, of her disease, but we don't hear anything about that here. Uh, all we hear is that immediately her hemorrhage stopped, but we don't hear her subjective experience of it. Uh, and there are a couple of other differences. I'll note right here, as, before we get to Luke's details, um, when Jesus asks who touched me again and looks around, Mark tells us that she told him the whole truth. Whereas uh, what we hear in uh, Luke was she declared in the presence of all why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. Uh, although we don't know what the why is. It's, the narrator says that she told why, but we actually don't hear why. So a number of differences there. And also uh, something we're going to be looking at is how uh, Luke has quietly made this woman con uh, contrast with the Gerasene demoniac we saw in the scene before. And as we're continuing this, I note that we're looking throughout this entire section here, uh, beginning with the story of them crossing the lake uh, in the middle of chapter 8, through the story of the Gerasene and through our current story, all the way through 950, around two themes, which I laid out a couple of videos ago, and you can look at it there. One is the question, who is Jesus, that we heard asked uh, by the disciples, at least rhetorically, from the boat. Who is this that can calm the wind and the waves, the water waves? But we'll also hear it momentarily from Herod, who asks, who is this? And then Jesus will ask the disciples who the crowd say he is and then who they say he is. So throughout this whole section, Luke is trying to show us who Jesus is and see what people say about that. Another theme throughout is about the disciples. And there are no disciples here. We saw them get in the boat with Jesus, and then we didn't see him get out of the boat on the Jerasa side. And we didn't see them get out of the boat back on the, uh, assuming we're, uh, we're in Galilee, but assuming we're near Capernaum or somewhere near there, we didn't see them get out there. We do see Peter mentioned here, but the other disciples don't seem to be here. So assume, we're assuming they're watching, um, but they're hesitant to speak up or do anything. And they'll come more central stage as the story continues after the end of our section right here. So uh, let's, let's look at directly at our section. The, in the verse before we saw, she had touched the fringe of his clothes and immediately the hemorrhage stopped. So then Jesus asked here, omitting Mark's 5.30, aware that power had gone forth from him, but he will name that uh, out loud here. So ironically, their narrator said that in Mark 5.30, and Jesus says it out loud here, whereas as we just saw, the narrator and the out loud talk is reversed in the other part of Mark's here. So who touched me? And as we've been looking at, that's the key word in this section. Touch, 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 touch. And as a number of scholars have noted, including uh, people whose work I looked at last time, uh, but also especially Shelley Rambo here, who does this incredible piece on trauma and faith, reading the narrative of the hemorrhaging woman. Uh, she does a lot about what trauma is and how that can strengthen faith or challenge faith. Um, but as we look at it here, she really wants to emphasize the embodied nature of that. Yet the woman has experienced trauma in her body. And the fact that, that Rambo needs to make such a point of this, and other scholars, including Sarah Harris, who we looked at last time, also need to make a point of that this isn't just a spiritual healing, but something physical, just highlights how much the development of Christianity from the very beginning distorted the embodied Jewish message of Jesus. And if you want to know more about that, you can see that in my book, Empire Baptized, how the church embraced what Jesus rejected from the 2nd to the 5th century. Uh, so even now, it's a surprise to some Christian listeners to this uh, video series or readers of the gospel that Jesus is actually concerned with the physical well-being of people. But the only reason we'd suspect otherwise is because of the platonic uh, overlay on top of the gospel that distorted um, so many of the embodied elements of the story. So here, the emphasis on touch throughout. 
So he asked, who touched me? And notice the me. Uh, all we know is that he touched the fringe, um, that she touched the fringe of his clothes. But he cl understands it as me. And that has to do with the power going out, which we'll get to in a minute. All denied it, which also will echo into all denying that they will be the betrayer later. Um, so everybody's in denial. It's not clear who the all is here, whether that's the disciples and the women or just the people in the crowd around him. But Peter speaks up here for the first time since his call in 5.8. And next time he'll speak up at the Transfiguration. And using the title Master, which we saw a little earlier in 8.24 and we'll see later, but is not a faith title um, for Jesus. That's a title of respect. Obviously, it's something similar to Lord. Uh, it certainly expresses uh, Peter's sense of social subservience to Jesus, but it's not the faith title we'll see. So at this moment, who Peter says Jesus is his master. So the crowds surround you and press in on you. And we see two words here, synecosin, seki, uh, apothlibusin here for these two words. Let's look more closely at the word for press, synecosin here, synago, nine of 12 times in the New Testament in Luke Acts. And we saw it just a few verses later, earlier in 837. Let's look at it there. Um, all the surrounding country of the, the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave for they were seized with a great fear. Here, the same word, held together by this great fear. So when we look at it here, um, it's a sense of being pressed together, um, pressed upon, held together, which is to say there's such a huge crowd pressing in that Peter thinks it's impossible for Peter or Jesus to distinguish who it is that touched him. And you can see that clearly in the image from Tissot's painting here. I showed it last time, but worth seeing again so you can see the uh, sense of why Peter thinks this is absurd. But what Luke's also doing is making the stark contrast with the previous Gerasa scene where the demon-possessed man met Jesus uh, at the boat and seemingly everybody else in the area hid because it's only after the man uh, was found well and dressed and the pigs had drowned in the sea that the people come out and are terrified of Jesus. So this exact opposite of a man possessed by the spirit of the Roman legion uh, who's terrified all the neighbors and here this woman who will hear not afraid but trembling as we down here. Mark or Luke actually takes away Mark's sense of that she was afraid uh, and only leaves it as trembling. Uh, but a crowd pressing in. So she's in the midst of this oppressing crowd. But Jesus says, someone touched me, for I noticed, or better knew or realized, Egnon from uh, Gnosis, um, to know. Uh, and so I, he knew that power had gone out from me. And that might seem odd to our ears, especially to Western rationalist ears, that touching somebody can make power go out from them. But it's really important that we not put this off in the mythological realm or try to explain it away as simply a rhetorical or literary uh, effect here. We well know the power of touch whether that's the touch of a baby, um, touching a baby, or the touch of a baby uh, that can be healing to an adult, or cuddling. We know how important cuddling is for people to feel wanted and welcome. And as Rambo notes in her trauma element here, that trauma is never simply individual. It's always part of a communal reality. And so Jesus' power from God is available much like healing power is available in many Native traditions. And I can certainly witness to the power of my wife Sue's um, healing touch, and not which she would never claim as her own, and neither is Jesus, but it comes from God because I've seen it happen. I've not seen the literally power go out from her, but I've seen her touch lead people to physical healing and to emotional and, and internal healing. Uh, so whether it's a matter of training or faith or what it is, it's a, a reality here, and Jesus experienced it. And so something physical has transferred from Jesus to this woman. He can feel it and it healed her. And so the scene shifts to her perspective, although she doesn't notice she doesn't ever speak out loud here. When woman saw that she could not remain hidden. Um, the word for remain hidden, lanthano here, um, is not in the Mark version. Uh, Luke adds that here. But notice how it echoes using a different word from Luke 8.17 that we saw earlier in this chapter. Nothing that's hidden that won't be revealed. Uh, and as we see from uh, Sarah Harris's work, I have the quote below, Jesus' role in Luke's account is to call her out of her hiddenness, which reveals her as a member of the new community. Because one of the points that Harris is making, we see this throughout so many of the healing stories, is the oppression um, here, um, not just the pressing of the crowd, but the oppression of being known as a, a woman who has this flow of blood has led her to be isolated. 
And as we saw back earlier, she spent all that she had, really her whole life substance, by us there, on healers, but they did not make her better, and no one else, it seems, has come up to help her, whether for money or for anything else. So for 12 years, she simply suffered alone, as far as we can tell, without any sense of community helping her. And so out of that desperation, she comes to Jesus and is immediately healed. But she now she knows she cannot remain hidden. Uh, why couldn't she remain hidden? She certainly seems like she could have remained hidden, just walked away, and how would anybody have known? Um, as we saw again from the pictures last time, in the midst of the crowd, it would be hard to specify who touched her, and Peter thinks the whole question is absurd. So she really could have gotten away with it, if that was the point, uh, but she doesn't try to do that. And she comes trembling here, tremoso, uh, taken from, directly from Mark, and falling down before him, uh, matching both uh, the demon-possessed man and Jairus, who fell at Jesus' feet here, she declared... Um, Mark has told, but here she uses the declare a word, which we say several times in this passage here. Um, in the presence of all the people, or literally in the sight of, an opion here, of all the people, and as I noted earlier in the Gerasene story, the New Revised Standard that I am trans have the translation of here uses the phrase all the people in that passage, but it literally the Greek doesn't say all the people, but here it does. She told, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him. Uh, a word for why or how is only here, although it's 20 times in the New Testament. As Green notes, she's presented as a hermeneut, which is to say someone who's interpreting the situation, and not simply as one who chronicles what has happened. So she's explaining the meaning of it, um, but we don't hear the meaning of it. Uh, in other words, she's doing much like what Luke is doing uh, in this very gospel, explaining the meaning of Jesus uh, in an orderly way, and how she had been immediately healed. She emphasizes the immediacy of that. And here, the healing um, is of healing, Yaomai here. Uh, she doesn't declare it as saved, but Jesus will change that, as we'll see in just this last verse. So he said to her daughter, which is a really unusual situation here, and we need to link that with another story of a healing of a daughter in 1316. Let's look at that briefly here, where we see this woman who is bent over. It says, and Jesus asked rhetorically, Ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from bondage on the Sabbath day? The issue there, obviously, was healing on the Sabbath, which we've heard earlier, but even in chapter 13, it's still a question. But notice, she's called daughter of Abraham there, which is what leads uh, one of the elements that leads Shaw to suggest she may be a Gentile. Uh, we can't assume from silence that every time somebody is a daughter of Abraham, Jesus would say daughter of Abraham. But certainly there's a distinction here between simply calling her daughter and calling the other woman, who has no name either, uh, daughter of Abraham. Uh, so... Um, if, if she's a Gentile, we can read it as something um, similar to the uh, Gerasene, and Shaw shows there's a little ABBA chiasm there, uh, with the first the healing uh, of the for the Jewish disciples in a private setting with the calming of the storm, the healing of the demoniac in the previous passage, um, he uses the word miracle, but a healing for a Gentile in a public setting. Uh, the one we're on now, the healing of the bleeding woman for, of a Gentile in a public setting, and the raising of Jairus' daughter for the Jewish people in a private setting. And so that's one way to read it, And uh, but we can also read it as if she was a Jewish person. And from that perspective, we see that people like Harris and Rambo highlight how um, she her belief that the fringes represent the commandments and that touching those can be healing expresses uh, that faith too. But key to what happens here is what Jesus says, daughter, your faith has not just made you well, but saved you. Go in peace. And I've posted this before, but I want to bring it up again in this context. Uh, the blue color-coded elements here, this is sozo, the word here, and soter, savior, and soteria, salvation, elsewhere. So the blue parts are the parts that are about Jesus um, himself. Uh, the purple parts are where other people's faith has saved them. The black parts are where it's part of a, a question. Uh, it's not about people in particular. Uh, and uh, the red parts are, are the parts where um, uh, it's not working the way Jesus wants it to. And so here we see in this section the parallel between this daughter and what we'll see the next one, uh, that they will both be, both daughters will be saved. And then we can see other places where your faith has saved you. Also the woman who anointed Jesus um, with perfume and dried his feet with her, with her hair back in 750. And then here we'll see it with a leper in 1719 and a blind man in 1842. So throughout this entire section we see it's other people's faith that has 
save them. Uh, Jesus isn't doing anything at all here. He's just walking through, and it's her faith that he has power, like a human uh, God-inspired battery here, uh, that she can tap into and make a circuit and have that uh, bring her healing. So it, it's salvation and peace. And we see peace a number of times here, um, again, matching the woman uh, that we saw at Simon the Pharisee's house uh, that we just mentioned. Salvation and peace are only in that place and this place here, and so there's a real parallel to that. So where this story goes, where we see immediately after this, while he was still speaking, someone from the leader's house came to say, your daughter is dead. Has Jesus let the daughter of a high-status official who might have gotten him uh, benefaction and fame, uh, has he lost that opportunity to heal an anonymous woman in the crowd, or can they both be healed? Of course, you probably already know the answer, but we'll see how that goes next time. See you then. Bye-bye.